Hello and welcome to Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's current affairs programme. My name's Emma Webb and this week I'm joined by senior fellow Rafe Hadelmanku and Peter Whittle, the director of the New Culture Forum. So let's begin by talking about the latest news to do with Rwanda. Uh, so this is uh, recently in the last 24 hours, uh, we've seen the European Court of Human Rights essentially blocking our ability to send these migrants to Rwanda, despite the fact that um, our own court had rejected the pleas of some of these migrants um, that they'd made to try and keep them in the country. So um, the European Court of Human Rights has overrided the judgment of UK courts. Uh, astonishing, I think you'd agree. I mean, this is like um, <clears throat> about as anti-democratic as you could get. I think a lot of people will be perplexed as to how this can even still be the case. I think possibly one of the reasons is the European Court of Human Rights is sort of not the EU, is it? Mm -hmm. That's the point. But it's the mere fact that a European court can actually uh, essentially supersede our own laws. Um, I don't quite know a way around this until, unless we actually just leave the convention, as think, simple as that. Do you think we should leave the European Court of Human Rights? I do rights? think the time has come for us to leave. Look, yeah. we actually set it up in 1951. It was the British who were the key mm. driving force. And the ideals of the European Court, the European Convention, of it were, at, for the time, very, very sensible. Uh, there were only two million um, refugees at the time. It was post-World War II. These were European refugees who were culturally similar, and there was a need to absorb them into, into countries. But we've, we've moved on 70 years, and the, the world has become a very different place. Now we're talking about 100 million displaced peoples around the world, and we need to actually uh, recognize that it's no longer fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's telling, isn't it, that the British courts sided with the government and the European court has uh, opposed the government on this. But I find that all of this, is, this is going to be great for Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party because it sets them up against the evil Europeans and mm -hmm. there's another way of actually distracting from the realities that the Rwanda plan is actually pretty useless. We're seeing how ineffective it is, even if it hadn't been for the European uh, court ruling on this, only a tiny handful of people would have been uh, taken to Rwanda. Uh, last week on a single day, there were 420 people who came over on boats. That's more than the entire mm -hmm. annual deportation numbers that are supposed to go to Rwanda. It's a complete lie that the government is tackling this issue. Uh, they should simply do what the Australians do and just stop the boats from ever landing on British soil. Mm -hmm. Intercept them and take them away. Process them on a British overseas territory somewhere. That will be the real mm -hmm. deterrent and do it for tens of thousands of people, not 300 a year. 300 should be the, the bare minimum per day who are deported. What did you think of this astonishing fact? I, I, I think it's just absolutely um, insane, really, that the European Court of Human Rights, um, they, they came to this judgment and then they didn't communicate it in full to our government. So um, Pretty Patel has criticised them for being opaque because obviously when our courts rejected these pleas to not be sent to Rwanda, they're not being deported, they're being sent to be processed. Um, and uh, Pretty Patel made the point that our own courts are, you know, that they've been very transparent in the way that they have given these judgments. They've, they have, to, to use a primary school term, shown their working out. It's clear why they've made the judgment they've made. Whereas the European Court of Human Rights, the last time I checked, hadn't even communicated to the British government the details of their judgment. Yeah. So they're preventing us from carrying out the will of a sovereign parliament, something that has already been justified under British law. Um, and they're overriding it w with, with the complete hubris of giving us no details as to why. It's extraordinary. I, I can't help seeing this as being part of a kind of cultural um, trend in the sense that our civil servants don't even want it to work as well. And then obviously as well, I know it's going off uh, the issue slightly. Well, not really. But there was somebody who was actually... Uh, prevented from being deported by a, a mm -hmm. Labour organised crowd down in Perkham. Yeah. Um, these people have no idea who it is that they're preventing. I mean, we saw this last year and the year before with these people on planes sort of like being uh, mm -hmm. prevented from Something being deported. Something similar happened recently in Scotland as well, in Glasgow. Exactly. They got underneath the car so that the deportation couldn't take place. This, all of this is a movement against the the majority's wishes. Mm -hmm. This is what's so extraordinary. Why is this proving so hard? You know? 
when it comes to the European Court of Human Rights, just ignore it. And those, I'm sorry, those individuals... I, it gets to the point where you've actually got to do something like that. People say, you can't possibly do that. You can't possibly do this. Well, people ignore the United Nations all the time. You know, what is this con construct anyway of international those people, law? Those people who showed up to, the, to prevent the, the, de the deportation from happening in Peckham, uh, surely that is obstructing officers in the course of their duty and they should have just been arrested. Yes, it, it is, but the, 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 but the fact is the officers notice. don't believe in their own power anyway. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. You know, that they probably offered them a cup of tea. Yes, exactly. You, it's a bit like with the Extinction Rebellion. This, the whole thing is a, is a problem with authority working against the wishes of people. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine this situation happening in Paris? Can you imagine the French police being so soft-handed? Mm -hmm. uh, Tear gas and rubber bullets. You know, exa exactly, you know, I mean, this is the problem. Our police have become completely ineffective and ineffectual. You know, some of us remember in the 80s, the miners' strike and how effective our police were in the old days. And it's, 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 become a, it's become a farce and, and a joke. But there's, there's Peckham, this, this mob, that's a, this Twitter mob who descended on the street in Peckham to prevent somebody who could have been a rapist, mm -hmm. who could have been a murderer. We have no idea who this person was and that who they defended. One of the key orchestrators behind this was a, a South London primary school teacher. And I looked at his Twitter account. He was thanking everybody for coming and saying, stay tuned for the next notice. And he said, South London primary school teacher, Lambeth, Marxist. Yeah, of course. And I thought, my God, imagine yeah, yeah. a school teacher openly admitting to being a Marxist on, the, on their mm. Twitter well, profile. On, on that point, I mean, obviously teachers shouldn't be so overtly political, but uh, there was something, uh, again, quite extraordinary from the Church of England, talk about a lack of self-awareness. So the uh, 20, all 25 bishops uh, of, of the Church of England that sit in the House of Lords, just to confirm without any shadow of a doubt that they are in fact as politicised as everybody accuses them of being, have come out with this open Open letter that they wrote to the Times saying that the Rwanda plan is our national shame and in an interview that Welby gave to the Times uh, he said this is a direct quote the idea that I shouldn't be political is nonsense everyone is political well firstly saying that ev everyone and everything is political is a very totalitarian way of looking at the world but also Given the way that they recently, as we discussed in the previous Newspeak, the way that they treated Calvin Robinson for not holding the same political mm -hmm. opinions as them, this is Justin Welby, not as many people have said, you know, accused him of before, that, that, they, that these bishops don't realise that they are being as political as they are. He's being overt and clear here. He knows mm -hmm. that he's being political. Mm -hmm. It's just his political opponents that he wants to shut down. So now these bishops, as well as we've just seen Prince Charles, Charles possibly, you know, Mm. poking at the constitutional hornet's nest by coming out and criticising the government's Rwanda policy, that they're all just showing how absolutely politicised they are and how out of touch they are and alienated from their congregations. Well, alienated as well, but just in political opposition to. Yeah. I mean, it's not just that they are out of touch in a well-meaning way. Mm -hmm. They are completely opposed to the majority view in the country. As for Charles, that is bad. I mean, I know he's Prince of Wales, right after his mother's jubilee. Wasn't uh, that, the that, was a, that, mm? that was the worst possible timing? That was the worst possible timing because... Well, so they, it's, well it was said in private, we have to say. It was it's said in, in private. private, it hasn't been corroborated. So we mm. don't actually know uh, whether he, he said it. And it wasn't said in, in a public setting. But I agree, it's, it's, it's very bad. Now, the, 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 the nation is evenly split over Rwanda and over the immigration issue. So half the nation think it's an outrage. The other half are very in favour of it, with obviously more people on the extreme on the two sides. And the whole issue that the Church of England had with Calvin Robinson was that they felt he was too divisive of a character. Well, I'm sorry, if you're taking a position on this yeah. issue, which has divided the nation, mm. you're being just as divisive, but from the other side, mm -hmm. uh, as you were saying. And uh, it just seems as if, you know, you have to remember also that most of the parishioners who fill the pews are actually on the side who are in favour mm -hmm. of the Rwanda issue. So if you want to tend to your flock, you might want to reflect their views rather than trying to uh, appeal to people on another side who probably are irreligious or an atheist at best. The thing is, is that, you know, people never ask what the motivation is for these people. You know, they sort of say, oh, well, that's the church. The church has always been bleeding heart or, you know, whatever. But when you go to all the institutions, people never ask, they never say, well, what is your motivation for this polit political position that you're taking? You know, and when you put it all together, 
it just basically seems to be entirely anti the British state. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. You know, that in fact you can argue the ins and outs of why they do it and how hypocritical it might be. But actually whether it's teachers we're talking about on a show like this or whether it's just the police or the church or whatever, then it seems it, it's entirely the same thing, which is to destabilise and to somehow go against... Well, it is, there's a kind of contemptuous attitude towards the British public, but particularly within the church. I think it's more political than that. But I they, think it's more but political. The, even within the church, the, the kind of con the contempt in, in implied by the suggestion that basically anybody, according to the Archbishop, who agrees with the Rwanda plan is being unchristian by doing so. Yeah, but they said that about Brexit. But, th but this is the point, is that they're holding their congregations in contempt and then exactly. wondering why they're losing bums on seat or bums on pews, as it and were. And it's also but fundamentally elitist, whether it's that yeah. Peckham Street where all the protesters were, mm -hmm. you know, Hooray Henry, white, privileged, yeah. uh, middle-class people, or whether it's the mm -hmm. bishops who are upper-middle-class and mm -hmm. upper-class. None of these people have any day-to-day -day interaction mm -hmm. with the, the problems caused by immigration. Mm -hmm. Nobody, yeah. None of these people have problems going to see their GP. None of these mm -hmm. people have to look, wait for a council flat. None of these people see how the streets around them are changing. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy for them from leafy Hampshire or wherever they yeah. are, and from the lovely houses in Islington and in, uh, you know, in Notting Hill, mm -hmm. to protest about these things when actually it doesn't affect them at all. But you say it's, it's a political mm -hmm. issue as well, but that's partly because I think part of that contempt and the, even the use of the use of the law in order to o override the sovereignty of parliament that it, the contempt of the of, that they have for the people is reflected in the contempt that they have for parliamentary democracy they don't like parliamentary democracy when it doesn't give them the results that they want because they think that the people are too stupid when they cast their vote they think they think they're too stupid also i mean there is this other way of looking at it is the church so worried about all the pews empty I mean, you sit there and then they complain about all the... No, that's true. The congregations you, are concerned about it. I don't know if I actually hear them complain. M maybe they don't care. Maybe well, they, they do not care. Maybe that is the whole point of it. They're trying to, trying to deconstruct the parish system. So maybe they are actually just trying to run no, the church into the ground. I don't think it's even as... Like, the parish system, it's not even as kind of, uh, shall we say, concerned and esoteric as that. Maybe it is the hollowing out of our institutions. Maybe they don't care about the, uh, the number of people in churches anymore. Maybe the police really do not care anymore about burglaries and that sort of thing that they no longer even bother to look at. Maybe they actually don't. Maybe they see their role now as being something entirely different. I mean, we can speculate on. You I think you've got to look at it yeah. in a wider thing. You, you mentioned Brexit. Let's <clears throat> talk briefly about Aaron Banks. So Aaron Banks um, lodged a libel case against Carol yes. Codswallop. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, so that's what I'm going to call her. Codwallader. Carol Catwoman. <laughs> Cod, Codwallader. Um, and th this uh, lady, she her, she's an investigative journalist. Um, Aaron Banks, for those who don't know, founded uh, Leave.eu. And uh, he sued her for two uh, occasions of defamation, one in a TED talk uh, and another in a tweet that linked to the TED talk, um, where she alleged that he had lied about his relationship with the Russian government in terms of funding and finances. And as far as I'm aware, and P Peter, maybe you could say more on this, it seems that the court has agreed that Aaron Banks didn't lie about his, his, his relationship with the Russian government, but that still he lost the libel case because it was believed to be in the public interest. Is that correct? Yes, I think that the way that, and what is insidious about this actually, is that in the judgment, as I understand it, uh, the judge made the point that um, it couldn't be libelous because what she said or claimed about him, she was saying to her followers, of which she has many, and therefore she was saying it within her echo chamber and so therefore, no damage done. Now, that revolutionizes the whole idea of libel, as even, I understand Even it. she herself doesn't, has admitted she apologized to him. She has said that what she said was untrue. Right, exactly. <laughs> so basically, what is, why, you know, how, if you have a, a judgment like that, it entirely changes the whole idea of a libel being published. I mean, and it also calls into question the role of Twitter. You know, what is Twitter? Is it a publisher? Is it just a platform? What is it? You see, if you publish certain things, um, that automatically makes you, you know, um, liable for the libel, as it were. 
Um, so th this is the weird thing. Does it mean that when you say something, <coughs> that because most of the people who follow you, I'm aware, uh, that basically you say yes, but my all of my all of my followers think that anyway about X or Y. So what's the, what's the damage? It's unbelievable that if this the, could be the judgment. Do you believe that if if the roles were reversed and I or someone from the Brexit camp had yeah. said something that was regarded, but somebody else regarded as being defamatory. Do you think it's politicised that if the if the tables were turned, then this would not be the result oh, of this uh, case? Oh, almost certainly. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound <coughs> like some crazy, you know, person here, but but almost certainly we know the answer to that. I, I you know, we just. Well, we have, we, have, we have to presume on the impartiality of a judge, although it has to be said in this case that the judge's partner yes, exactly. is, a, is yeah. a Lib Dem arch-Remainer who uh, very much loathes and detests Brexit. So whether <laughs> she shares the views or whether she just wants to have a peaceful breakfast every morning and rather than uh, being attacked by her partner over this, I don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate. Now, of course, it's, it's, it's important to also know that the public interest is something that must be defended. And of course, we have to also think of it the other way. If somebody on the left had been attacked, we would want to ensure that actually journalists do have the right to um, analyze that their, their, their affairs. But it's patently untrue what they were saying about uh, Car Carol Cat Catwoman's uh, Twitter <laughs> account being a closed shop, because I follow her, for example. Yeah, and as do I. Follow. Lots <laughs> of people on the right follow her. So they're being exposed to all of her rantings and ramblings. Uh, so, the, the, so I think, if anything, and uh, uh, Banks should be looking at grounds for an appeal on this, um, and I would hope he does appeal it I to a higher court because yes. uh, I don't think the story necessarily is over. I think you know when, actually, as a more general point, um, I always liked Aaron. Got on fine with Aaron uh, Banks, and but when you look at what some people went through as a result of that, I think at one point I don't want to misquote him. But I think he did say something like, if I'd known what it was opening up, I don't think I'd ever have really got involved. Yeah. Because it's just been horrendous. I mean, they went after people, you know, who were either funding campaigns. Darren Grimes is an example. Yes, Darren Grimes. In a, in they a tried to ruin way. people's lives. I learned about Darren Grimes long before he was on, uh, I saw him on anything to do with the media. He was just a young guy who was doing a particular part of the campaign, and they kind of warned for him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I think Aaron must look back and sort of think, well, maybe that wasn't a particularly good move, me getting involved. So uh, let's talk about the uh, football, Peter. You said you wanted to talk about football, and I football. thought that was very uncharacteristic of you. <laughs> England. Yeah, no, no, I just it's interesting that this point has been made, that, you know, terrible defeat for England, 4-0 to Hungary. And yet there is, what I thought was far more important was that the team who maybe you would think should be looking at quite how they improve their game mm -hmm. um, were still taking the knee. Um, and indeed, Gareth Southgate, the manager, uh, said something like, we hope, we feel we need to educate people. I mean, the so arrogance of that. Well, yes, and, since when do we, and they wonder why they get booed. <laughs> since when do we look to footballers for uh, enlightenment on, on, on issues mm -hmm. of, you know, of intellectual merit? Just this idea that they somehow are privy to facts mm -hmm. that are you know, off limits to the rest of us and we're not clever enough. But these, these footballers are, you know, have somehow got to... And without going into <clears> details, I mean, footballers are hardly, you know, you can hardly be raised as examples of paragons of virtue, can they? No, many, of course in not. In many instances. But the, but the thing is, ma majority of them, uh, the majority of them would not even really know the ins and outs of what this is really about. You know, uh, to, to them, probably, Black Lives Matter, brilliant slogan, how can you possibly disagree and everything? They wouldn't go into the ins and outs of the uh, organisation, what it means, what it actually, how it makes its money, all of that stuff, wouldn't go into it. I think the main thing is, it's just that it's still going on. It is still going on. And it's just, just incredible to me. But when I look at Gareth Southgate, he's got that kind of, he looks to me like a woke geography teacher. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so I'm not sort of. And the, and the idea that the that England should lecture countries of Central and Eastern Europe about oppression, you know, mm. and, and all of this, when you know, if anything, the Hungarians should be lecturing them about, you know, put things into perspective. You've never had it so good. You know, Britain is hardly racist. The whole George Floyd BLM thing is this exclusively American issue. It has no relevance mm. to England and British life. Mm. This is one of the least racist countries in the world. Western Europe, Canada, Australia, and mm -hmm. South America are, the, are well factually known to be the least racist in all the polls that you look at. The Hungarians actually are, are the country who should be basically saying to people, get some perspective, chaps. You're living in a great country. Get off your knees and clap your hands. Yes, exactly. How, how much... And, mar oh, sorry, go ahead. And also, uh, and on top of that, of course, they're all going off to Qatar. Uh, you know, where, in fact, you know, <laughs> being a gay is illegal. Democracy. You can be thrown off a building or whatever. And and I, if ethnic minorities are dying yes, in, and in, if in I'm not extreme wrong, heat working yes. on these buildings. If <laughs> I'm not wrong, the Gulf has a really bad slavery problem. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it goes on and on. But I think they actually have slave market apps now. No. We'll do a little fact check on that first. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm pre I think that's, a, I think that's a thing in the Gulf. These, be it, this is ridiculous. It's interesting that it's lingered the longest in football, actually. I don't quite know why. Do you think it's got much mileage left in it? Like how many Hungarian children have to boo until they stop taking the knee? Well, I, don't, I think Hungarians, they can sort of like, they will ignore. I think it's uh, here. I don't know. I don't know. I think this booing happens pretty much at almost any match where they do this now. Mm -hmm. um, but it just makes them, presumably, it makes them feel like they, that their, their mission is vindicated, that they, they really are barbarians in the stalls and they have, to, they have to educate them because clearly they must be racist if they're booing. Because, well, they're, just, yes. because they're being so arrogant that they refuse to listen to what the other side is saying to them. I think that it will come seriously unstuck. At the, is it the World Cup that's happening in Qatar? That's right. Um, I think it will come seriously unstuck with the, the sheer kind of uh, inconsistency and hypocrisy. And uh, again, if they say, we feel we should educate. Actually, no, I think you should be educated. You are the ones who need to be educated. And that way you probably wouldn't be going to Qatar. So just, just before we end, one final quick story because it's so mad that I have to mention it and I just want to get your thoughts on it quickly. The World Health Organization has decided to rename monkeypox because they think it's racist. And um, they dodgy, renamed though. it to um, something that sounds like a prison. HMPXV is the name that they think. Very catchy um, name that they think. Yeah. People Majesty's be... Prison 15. <laughs> <'Cause it's>, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I never thought of monkeypox being racist. I mean, what are they implying? What race are they implying? I mean, this is the thing. It says more about the, what they're thinking yeah, yeah. than yeah. it does about anybody else's yeah. thinking. And I think they're now putting ideas into people's heads that weren't there in the first place. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What, what, what's, what's the racism behind chickenpox? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> what, what, what culture that's supposed to be Do you about? think this is the same uh, attitude that the footballers have? That the World Health organization think that the, the rest of the world outside their little elite bubble is so barbarous that they're as, as racist as the assumptions that they're presuming that they think monkeypox is going to suddenly incite people to oh, violence. Absolutely. I mean, Rafe's, you know, quite absolutely correct. I mean, it, the, you know, it is, a, you know, sheer projection, uh, you know, but um, it is uh, extraordinary. But is it even still a thing, monkeypox? I'm not sure it ever Have they was. made it? <laughs> well, no, have they actually, they've made it a sort of uh, emergency level... There was some talk about it being airborne, virus, but it doesn't yes. seem to really be a yes. problem. Yes. So but, I think, but I think, no, but I think that the real issue here is that it shows that all of our institutions see everything through race now. It's the first mm. thing that comes to the mm -hmm. minds of all of these people. It's race. They're obsessed. Mm -hmm. And it's always at some imagined community or some imagined, they, are, they assume, mm -hmm. they have this, you know, imagined group of people that are going to be offended by it or an imagined group of people that are going to react in this sort of... You know, we used to have something we're coming up to called the silly season uh, in the press. It was always August, right? This is long before your time. And uh, I don't think, A, we have a silly season now because the press works in a different way. And secondly, n most of these stories that we're talking about now wouldn't have really seen the light of day even during silly season. People said, nah, that's, that's rubbish. You know, they, people aren't going to believe that. I mean, it's silly season all the time, culturally <laughs> all year round. So on that note, and that embarrassing note for the World <laughs> Health Organization, we're watching you, World Health Organization. We see you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rafe. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, and we will see you next time on Newspeak. Yeah. Hello. 
If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.